I'm Jerome Weeks. How does an archaeology student at Southern Methodist University contribute to a major museum show on ancient Maya culture? Michelle Rich is a PhD candidate in anthropology at SMU. She was the field director of a dig in Guatemala in 2006 when her team uncovered the tomb of a Maya king. Inside was an array of artifacts and figurines. Some are now on display in the Kimball Art Museum's exhibition, Fiery Pool, the Maya and the Mythic Sea. Michelle, welcome to Think. Thank you, Jerome. Now, the, you were on a dig in the Maya capital uh, in Guatemala, uh, and SMU has an ongoing archaeological project there. Tell us about El Peru Huacá. Sure. Um, El Peru Huacá is an ancient Maya city in northwestern Paten, Guatemala. The El Peru Huacá archaeological project was started by David Friedel, who was formerly a professor at SMU and oh. is now at Washington University in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. So he began the project uh, in 2001. We did our first reconnaissance trip to El Peru and we began digging in 2003. How big is this city? Um, we're, well, because we work in kilometers instead of miles, I hope that's not too confusing, but it's a, the city center itself is about 1.2 kilometers by about a kilometer, and it encompasses about 780 some buildings in that central area. Now, of course, um, that really is what we would consider to be downtown. <laughs> and beyond that, we have sort of the suburbs mm -hmm. and then radiating out into the more rural areas. So mm -hmm. there's, there's um, settlement all around the city. Now you and your coworkers descend into these shafts on, on, on ropes. What was it like discovering the, the tomb? Just another day in the salt mines? Well, <laughs> not exactly. Um, the, the shaft to which you're referring, I actually uh, was excavating a one by one meter unit in order to get a chronological sampling, a chronological sequence of the different construction episodes of that particular pyramid at the They're layered. The, right. The, the, the different levels of historical construction that went on. Right. The Maya would build a building and then they would build on top of it mm -hmm. and then they would build another version of it over the top of that. So it was kind of like a layer cake or an onion. You can peel, you can't really peel back the layers, but you can get a, an idea of those different mm -hmm. construction episodes. So that was the purpose of that shaft, and it just so happened that I placed it so that it came down on top of the roof stones of an ancient tomb chamber. Now what was so significant about the, that tomb and what you found inside? Uh, the tomb that contained the figurines is actually adjacent to the, the tomb that mm -hmm. we found down at the base of that shaft. Mm -hmm. So that's a different tomb inside the building, but um, it, it's the tomb of a ruler that we didn't know by the epigraphic record. So mm -hmm. the written record that we have for El Peru Waka didn't tell us about that king. Um, so that was important. And then inside of that tomb chamber, we found the types of lavish mortuary artifacts that would accompany a ruler of, a, of an important Maya city in his travels through the afterlife. Um, and the figurine assemblage that we discovered is one of the only figurine assemblages that comes from a scientifically excavated context. In all of Mesoamerica, there's probably three or four figurine assemblages. Now so. the figurines represent the royal household and a, and a kind of ceremony, a funeral ceremony? Yeah, they do. Um, they depict both humans and supernatural beings, which it might be hard for us to sort of conceive of, but um, the, the uh, ceremony is being conducted by both human figurines, which represent the different men and women of the royal court, and then dwarves, who were important uh, members of ancient Maya royal courts because they symbolized sort of a transitional liminal space. They were, they were um, powerful because they were different. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there are dwarves in this figurine assemblage. There's also a shaman. And uh, together, the uh, figurine assemblage depicts a ritual, basically um, sending a deceased king off into the afterlife. So wishing him well on his journey through the underworld after death. Um, and the living king and his queen 
are also part of this uh, figurine assemblage. It's a little bit like what was discovered with the pharaoh's tombs, that they would recreate the household and the, the items and the people and that kind of thing because they were way to accompany him. Right, but they're small scale, so <laughs> they... Um, How big are they? Well, the human figurines are probably about um, a foot tall, maybe not, e not even a foot, mm -hmm. so they range anywhere from about yay high to okay. <laughs> so, so how did some of these figurines end up in Firey Pool at the Kimball? Well, the, the, uh, on the original request that we received from one of the curators of the show, Dan Finnamore, he had heard about one of the dwarf figurines which holds a conch shell. Um, and there are several actual conch shells in the exhibit. And so this little dwarf is show holding this conch trumpet. And uh, Stephen Houston and Dan Finnamore requested the permission to use that figurine. But because we had discovered them as an assemblage, and because the assemblage itself represents uh, passage through the watery underworld, we, um, we felt it was important for the whole set of figurines to be shown together. Um, they do reference the sea in a variety of ways. Uh, if you look at the king figurine, the living king, he's got a gigantic uh, shell necklace on. Mm -hmm. He, um, uh, there's a, a deer figurine that is wearing a necklace that depicts the wind and eek symbol. There's a similar necklace in the exhibit itself. So what's really great about these figurines, besides being scientifically excavated, we have secure archaeological context on them, they really show us how some of the jewelry and the objects that the ancient Maya used, they show us um, in action with people, mm -hmm. with other creatures, and how we can see not just this conch shell trumpet in and of itself, but how it was held by a dwarf and used in the context of this entire ritual. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the big breakthroughs in our understanding of the Maya uh, came with deciphering their, their hieroglyphs. And what emerged was this image of uh, Maya as uh, death-obsessed, um, uh, fascinated with bloodletting and all that. And the fiery pool seems partly intended to offset that with its image of the, the sea, the, the, the importance of water, things like that. Can you explain? Sure. Um, the well, the ancient Maya kings were divine kings, and it was their responsibility to let blood, to ensure successful uh, cycles of life and growth, especially when it comes to crops and, and um, making sure that the people in their communities were properly fed and taken care of. So in that regard, um, the sea relates to that because a lot of the resources that the Maya used were from the sea fish and shells and other water-oriented animals like crocodiles, you'll and see Stingrays. Those. And exactly. Uh, so, so I think we have, we're getting past this sort of obsession with the Maya as being um, focused on bloodletting and kind of seeing them more as a whole culture, seeing different aspects of their culture. And I think the Fiery Pool Show really does a good job of reminding us that the Maya lived in the Yucatan Peninsula, which was surrounded by water. And the Maya who lived further inland oftentimes were located close to rivers, which were basic major conduits for travel mm -hmm. for the Maya. So we, we should try to remember to look at ancient peoples more broadly and think about various aspects of their societies. And, and the fiery pool really highlights the watery aspect of the ancient Maya. Very quickly, there's a wonderful uh, piece in a fiery pool. It's a 10-pound jade head uh, sculpted as the jester god. Mm -hmm. But it's also a bird god. And I think it's one of the things that's difficult to, for many people to grasp about the Maya beliefs is that they are these multiplicity, these mixes of, mixtures of characters. Right. Is that common and why? It is common because the Maya were um, fantastic artists, first of all, and they were able to incorporate multiple messages into a single object. So if it sounds like uh, Mayanists or Maya scholars are kind of trying to say this represents everything but the kitchen sink, that's not the case. The Maya themselves were sending multiple messages through single objects. So it would be a historical figure and a god. Yeah. It can be both of those things at the same time. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Jerome.
To read more about Fiery Pool and the ancient Maya, go to artandseek.org. Chris? Thanks, Jerome. To access our free podcast, you can go to the Think page of KERA's website, kera.org slash think. And we'd like to know your thoughts on the show as well. You can email us at think at kera.org. My name is Chris Boyd. Thanks for being with us and have a great week. To learn more, go to kera.org slash think. Think is made possible in part by... Dell Services. Dell Services develops and delivers a comprehensive suite of IT and application services, business process solutions, and consulting services designed to help customers succeed. For more information, you can visit dell.com slash services. By Southwest Securities, a nationally recognized regional brokerage firm that's been meeting the needs of Southwest investors for more than 30 years. Southwest Securities is a member of the New York Stock Exchange and SIPC by the Executive Education Center at the University of Texas at Dallas, providing degree and non-degree programs to help corporate professionals and executives stay ahead. On the web at som.utdallas.edu slash executive. And by the valued support of KERA members. Thank you.